Following the path of Jesus, and man, we have been following it pretty well. As Christians, we should be following the path of Jesus. And as a matter of fact, I'm really excited about you being here tonight. I'm excited about Thursday nights. I'm excited about Wednesday nights also. Because it's people who really want the Word of God. And unfortunately in our world today, there is a dearth, there is a lack of teaching the Word of God. Somebody say amen. And so we really need it because it's part of us following Him. And as I study it, we need it. And uh, we need, I need to study it. We need to teach it. So we've been following Him and we're getting very close. We're in a very interesting spot. We've been following Him from the cradle to the cross. And we've been following His entire life. The sacrificial lamb that was slain. Uh, it's one of the things that Jesus, it is the thing that Jesus came to do. And this will mess with your mind just quick, quickly before we study tonight. This will mess with your mind. And all that dwell upon the earth, Revelation says, 13, shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the lamb of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. Now that's a time verse. It'll mess with your mind. We'll talk about it later. It means that Jesus was slain way before he was ever slain on Calvary. What does that mean? Well, it means that past, present, and future are all the same to God. Somebody say amen. But not just that. So we know that he's slain before the foundations of the world. But, the but uh, Ephesians also tells us this. Uh, Paul also knew this. But according he has chosen us, everybody say he has chosen me. In Him, before the foundations of the world, before you were in your mother's womb, God chose you. And it says that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. So you have been chosen. This is not your decision. He chooses us. Somebody say amen. Then it goes a little bit further. He tells Second Tim in in Timothy, he tells him this, Who has saved us, God, and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, you can't gain heaven by your works, but according to His own purpose and grace, which was given us... In Christ Jesus before the world began. That verse should mess you up really royally today. It means that God had a purpose for you before the whole world was even begun. That is an amazing verse of scripture. And so basically we have studied in detail his burial. This is what we studied so far. The descent from the cross, the burial, the watch at the sepulcher. It's extremely interesting and exciting times because we're getting really close to the resurrection. And we're going to take some weeks to tell you about all the details of the resurrection. Believe it or not, we miss a lot of it by just hearing a couple Easter sermons. We miss a whole lot of the teaching of the resurrection. So we've studied his descent from the cross. We've studied his burial. And we've studied the watch at the tomb. Then last week, the most, the most CDs we've ever sold uh, last week, or from last week, the significance of Jesus' descent into hell. Matter of fact, Brian told me that as soon as they put that onto the YouTube, it immediately got hit. It got smashed. Everybody ought to hear about it. Uh, we talked about Jesus and Sheol, and I guess it's interesting to people because they've never heard about it. We've talked about the great gulf that was fixed between them and heaven and hell. And we've studied this, uh, this paradise and what paradise meant. We talked about that great gulf, and we talked about what that meant, Abraham's bosom, paradise, the place of torment. Uh, one, the, uh, so basically, we, we also told you this. Jesus went there, he jumped that gap, and he delivered the captives. You have ascended, Psalm says, on high. You have led captivity captive. You have received gifts for men, yes, for the rebellious also. Jesus dies, and he, and he, goes, he uh, goes to, for those three days, he goes to Sheol, to hell if you want. And basically what he does, his three-day journey into the underworld, he captivates the captives. He takes them back to paradise with him. And so, uh, excuse me, to heaven from paradise. So, let's begin tonight our study tonight we're going to see what happens right before the discovery of an empty tomb right before the discovery of an empty tomb and the resurrection of Jesus from the dead so tonight here's what we're going to look at don't mind that first misspelling it's very hard to do all these things and get them all right all the time that's the earthquake then coming of the women to the sepulcher to anoint the body they find it too empty and an angel announces he is risen. Now we may think we know all of this and we may know a cursory view of it, uh, but basically I want to tell you the, the, the truth and the depth of this, of this tonight. So let me sidestep momentarily. Tonight I want to talk to you about biblical earthquakes and what they meant and what they mean today. This is uh, something that we really need to think about and we need to talk about. Before I do that, let me give you our, ver our verse. And behold, there was a great earthquake. For the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door. The angel rolled the stone back, by the way. And he sat on it and says, uh, His countenance was like lightning, his raiment white as snow, and for fear of him the keepers did shake and became his dead man. Now I can stop right here and tell you that I'll bet, most if I was a betting man, which I'm not, I would tell you that most of us didn't know that the angel sat on the stone. I'll show you a picture later on, uh, a rendition of the angel sitting on the stone. So he rolled it away and he sits on top of the stone. Again, it's mentioned in all four Gospels that this uh, stone was rolled away. This is the only place that's mentioned that he sat on it. So let me divert just a little bit. 
There are 17 earthquakes related to us in, in the Word of God. 17 of them. And uh, every one of them, and by the way, they are very, very interesting because every one of them, they're well-known events in the world of Bible history and the Bible story. Well-known events, these earthquakes. A lot of them are actually documented by archaeologists and documented by, by volcanologists who know when these earthquakes happen. There's a lot of evidence that remain. Every one of them has great significance. The Holy Land is a region where earthquakes many times frequently occur. Matter of fact, last week there was a 4.0 in Jerusalem. And so we don't hear about it a whole lot, but there's a lot of earthquakes in that area. Big earthquakes have been documented in the Holy Land for a period exceeding 4,000 years. Again, many are well known by history, archaeology, and the Bible itself. There's 27 Bible verses about earthquakes. No other region on the earth has such a long documented history and chronology of earthquakes. And uh, here's why. It's called the Syro-African Rift. And if you want to see where these plate tectonics are, the moving of the plates, the syro african Rift is right here. Let me get my red pointer. There you go. It comes up from Africa, from the western coast of Africa. It transects through directly through Israel. The entire land, there's a fault line. You want to talk about the, San, San, uh, the, uh, the New Madrid's fault or the, uh, or the fault that's in California? Let me tell you something. That, that makes those look tiny. This is a major fault line. It's gigantic. It goes through to, and then it transects this area and then back through Saudi Arabia, over Saudi Arabia, actually by Iran, Iraq, Afghanistan, and then goes towards Greece. This right here is the mo one of the most active places on the planet, believe it or not. And uh, basically, uh, God will use this pressure of these plates many times in the big events of Israel's history. So, I'm going to give you the 17 earthquakes that are mentioned directly or indirectly in the Bible. Is that all right? Number one, day three of creation. On the third day of creation week, the waters of the earth were covered in, in, uh, collected into the oceanic basins and continents appeared. And so we know that day three had to have some seismic... God uses natural things to, to do His will. Somebody say amen. They had to do some seismic activity to collect these things. There was Pangaea, one earth, one landmass. Eden was one landmass. We know that. It broke apart. Earthquakes. That's later on. We'll tell you about that later. But the, the beginning, the Bible talks about the, the waters being collected. That's the start of all these, all these uh, fault lines and earthquakes. It's Genesis chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. Massive quakes. Before day three, the waters have been over the whole earth. Continents seem to have been uprooted and the ocean floor was depressed during a great faulting process that established the foundations of the earth. And from there on, you hear about the foundations of the earth. We're told that angels saw it and praised the omnipotent God as the earth-shaking process occurred. Job chapter 38, verses 4 and 7. I have to go quickly on this so we know that day three, God separated the land from the water. The only separation can happen is through plates. Number two, Noah's flood. We know that Noah's flood also had earthquakes. The Bible says the great deep was broken over, open. Matter of fact, in Indonesia, most of the earthquakes we've seen that are very, very large earthquakes are happening in the great deep, like the Mariana Trench off of Indonesia, where we know there was an earthquake in December 25th of 2014, excuse me, 2012, that shook the, 2004, that shook the earth, actually wobbled it on its axis. Uh, one of the largest earthquakes we've ever seen. Tsunamis hit everywhere, including Indonesia, India, Japan. It hit Africa. Uh, this, is the, uh, this is the same deep that the Bible's talking about, the great deeps breaking open. There was a year, the flood, Noah's flood did not happen for 40 days and 40 nights. It rained 40 days and 40 nights. But if you read the account, the, the flood was a year and 10 days. Uh, so the long, year-long global flood in days of Noah was the greatest sedimentary and tectonic event in the history of our planet since the creation. One of the primary physical causes of this great judgment was the fountains of the great deep were broken open, all of which uh, were broken open on a single day. Could you imagine? On a single day. Number three, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Fire and brimstone comes from volcanic activity and earthquake activity. Usually volcanic activity and earthquake activities in the same general region. And if I took you to Israel and took you to the Dead Sea, I will show you the volcanic ash that's all over the backside where you, when you go over to Jordan. So the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, Genesis 19, 24 to 28. Fire and brimstone, five cities in all were destroyed by volcanic and seismic activity. Number four, Moses on Mount Sinai. The mountain shakes, Exodus chapter 19, verse 18 says. It's directly on, by the way, Mount Sinai is directly on that syro african rift. If I were to take you down into that line, that black line that went down there, Mount Sinai is right underneath that black line. Uh, so it's directly under that syro african rift. Number five, you may not remember this from Scripture, 
That's Korah's rebellion in the wilderness. It seems that Korah got an army of men together to oppose Moses in his rebellion. That's Exodus chapter 19, verse 18. The Bible literally says the earth shakes and the earth quakes and swallows up Korah and his followers. Again, that area in the wilderness is the Sinai. That Sinai is exactly where that Syro African Rift is. Number six, the fall of Jericho. This one's very interesting. I love preaching on Jericho because the fall of Jericho is amazing. Joshua chapter six. Now, it doesn't say that Jericho fell from an earthquake, but Jericho sits directly on top of that same Syro African Rift. We can draw a line through all the places I'm telling you, and they're all on that Syro African Rift. And Jericho, listen to what happens. God commands them to walk around it six days, on the seventh day to shout. We're talking about two and a half million people shouting. We know that seismic activity can be triggered by loud noises. Listen, God is amazing. Come on, somebody say amen. Number seven, how many are learning a little bit tonight? Took a lot to compile this. Listen, Philistine camp near Geba. Geba. Uh, it's an, the Bible actually says it was an earthquake. It occurred in the camp, 1 Samuel 14, 15, allowing Jonathan and his army time to escape. The Philistines otherwise would have killed them. And there was an earthquake that God caused so that they can escape. And Giza is also, guess where? On the Syro African Rift. Let me give you another one. Elijah on Mount Horeb. Remember, he went up to Mount Horeb. And the Bible talks about he was looking for God's voice. And it wasn't in the trees. Or it wasn't in the, it wasn't in the fire. It wasn't in the rain. And it wasn't in the earthquake. The Bible says, literally, there was an earthquake. But God was not in the earthquake. And of course, he heard it in a still small verse, voice. 1 Kings 19.11. Amos. Um, earthquake of 750 B.C. This one's documented. As a matter of fact, that's, that split right over here is from that earthquake. This is well documented. 750 B.C. is the time Amos lived. Scientists have documented this quake. There's lots of things around Israel that have shown signs of this quake. Uh, we know that Amos' earthquake uh, near Gezer, again, the same spot on that line. Then we know Qumran. If I take you to the place in the desert where, the, where John the Baptist spent time as uh, part of the Qumran uh, and the Essenes, this is a mikvah, a holy a ritual bath from the first from the 31st century 31 BC they had a massive earthquake right there and that's one of the fault lines from that earthquake we also know that the crucifixion earthquake we talked about that last week that's April 3rd 29 AD the veil of the temple is rent and Matthew 27 54 by the way Mount of Olives is directly over the line. We know that because in 1966, the uh, Holiday Inn sent the surveyors over there and seismologists to build a Holiday Inn right on, the, right on the Mount of Olives overlooking the old city, and they would not build it because of the earthquake activity. Number 12, which we've been talking about tonight, the uh, three days later, the resurrection earthquake, April 5th, 29 AD. Now, I want you just to keep those in mind because I'm going to tell you about the earthquake and I'm going to really bring something out tonight that I've never seen before. I really feel the Lord let me, let me find it and I'm going to bring it to you tonight. So I'll share with the last five earthquakes with you in a moment. But let's stop and look what the Word says. Let's look at our, at our text. It says this, In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn towards the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake. For the angel of the Lord descended from heaven, came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. That was the text that we started with. Uh, Matthew tells us that, that, that Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to the sepulcher. In Mar it, so they see that the stones rolled away. Mark chapter 16 fills in a little bit more. It tells us the other Mary was the mother of Joseph's. Or Joses. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, the mother of James, it's Joses, and Sol uh, Salome, another woman, had brought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. Salome was actually, I told you this before, she was the wife of Herod's steward, of the steward of his house. So Herod had someone in his house that was not only saved, she was, she was, a, she was a, a dynamic follower of Christ at the crucifixion, at the tomb. We know that Luke will tell us a little bit more. Luke says this, Now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, there came unto the sepulcher bringing the spices which they had prepared and certain others with them. So we know there's at least three women and probably more women that have come with them. Come very early. They're coming to anoint the body of Christ uh, for, for his death. And John chapter 20 concentrates specifically on Mary, uh, on Mary Magdalene. It says, The first day of the week comes Mary Magdalene early when it was yet dark unto the sepulcher and sees the stone taken away from the sepulcher. So, I have two questions tonight, and just two questions. The first one can be answered. The second one we need to discuss. Question number one, why did they go to the tomb? Anybody hear the studies, I was, the verses I just told you about? Why did they go? To anoint the body, is that right? Okay, it's a pretty easy question to answer, so look at. 
Very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came unto the sepulchre at the rising of the sun. The Bible tells us this. It says, Now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came unto the sepulchre, bringing the spices which they had prepared and certain others with them. What spices were they? Well, we know that they brought myrrh. Myrrh was a spice of death. Let me tell you what it did. It smells like fresh flowers. Matter of fact, one of the reasons we give flowers when someone dies is for the same reason. Even though we don't know it's for the same reason, they gave flowers to hide the smell of death. And so we give flowers today as a complimentary thing to show our love, but that's where it comes from. Uh, myrrh smelled like fresh flowers. Remember the wise men when they gave gifts to Jesus? How many know this is all tied together? What was one of the gifts they gave him? It's prophetic. It's to show that he was going to die. It's to show his mission. I'm telling you, I believe really the Holy Spirit showed them which ones they should give. They gave gold because gold was to show he's going to be a king. He's going to, be a, he's going to have a kingdom. And they gave frankincense because frankincense means he's able to be worshipped. They used it in incense. When I was a Catholic, they had frankincense and all the little incense burners they had. And so those three gifts were prophetic gifts. This one is the time for the myrrh. So how many are learning a little bit today? So let me continue. Um, they prepared this, these, these uh, spices. They prepared them. Look, it says, had prepared. So they did this before they came. I want you to understand it. And it says this. And they said among themselves, Who shall roll us away the stone from the door of the sepulcher? By the way, from where they came in Jerusalem, you couldn't bury anybody inside the city. From where they came in Jerusalem, close to the upper room, to where they went is about one and a half to two miles. So they're walking two miles. Very, they're walking while it's dark. They're going to get there while it's light. And so, because it's going to take them a little while to get there. And so, basically, they said among themselves, probably on the way, who shall roll us the stone away from the door of the sepulcher? And when they looked, they saw that the stone was rolled away, for it was very great, huge. And entering into the sepulcher, they saw young men sitting on the right side, clothed in a long white garment. And they were frightened, and they said unto them, Be not afraid, and you seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen, he's not here. Behold, look at the place where he lay. And it says this, uh, But go your way, tell his disciples and Peter, I love that, because Peter had denied Christ. And he's giving him an opportunity. He's naming him by name. Tell his disciples, and oh, don't forget Peter. And Peter, that he goes before you into Galilee. There shall you see him as he said unto you. So the angels give them the general outlook of what Jesus is going to do. And eventually he will make it to Galilee. So let me recap. They start out while it's yet dark. These at least three women. They're carrying anointing spices that they prepared the night before. No doubt, myrrh which is one of the things that's for his burial. They get to the tomb and they find the stone rolled away. And a strange light is coming out of the tomb. They notice it is empty. And they, but a young man is sitting on the side of the tomb, the right side of the tomb. They notice it's empty. A young man is sitting on the right side of the tomb. Obviously, an angel is appearing as a man. Luke tells us there's two angels. Maybe that one that sat on the stone too. Matt tells, Matthew tells us that there's one of them rolled the stone away and sat on it. I don't, know if you, I don't know what you would do if you saw that, but I know what I would do. Okay, so question number one is answered. Why did they go to the tomb? To, know, to everybody. Here's my second question. You ready for it? Why did they go to the tomb? I told you, this one we're going to have to discuss. Sounds like the same question? Not really. Not what God showed me. Listen, it's, it's, I started out this study telling you about the hot spot in Israel for earthquakes. At Jesus' death and burial, two, in the two days, excuse me, in three days' time, two earthquakes happened in the same spot. Now, I want you to understand the physicality of this. I don't want you to just read through it and see the story. I want you to see what's going on here so you know the mindset of the people, because that's what we're studying here. So the first earthquake, seismologist tells us, whenever there's a first earthquake, it is the great earthquake. It's the big one. Uh, when, Sumatra, when Sumatra erupted and it had its earthquake, they had a, it had an 8.0. The next one came with 7.0. The next one came with 6.0. Then they had 100 at 5.0. And then they have 4.0s. Always the first one is the great earthquake. The rest of them are smaller. You getting that? The first one came at Jesus' death. Look at this. Now when the centurion and they that were with him watching Jesus saw the earthquake. So the centurion sees it from Golgotha. Golgotha, believe it or not, is right on that same fault line. And those things were done. They feared greatly saying, truly this was the Son of God. But something really, really strange happens. It would have been, this one would have been the big one. This one would have been whatever it was. An 8.0, a 7.0. Notice it's called just the earthquake. 
But normally the second one would have been smaller. But look at what the Bible says about that second earthquake. And behold, there was a great earthquake. That means megas. It's a different earthquake than the first one. It means it's much bigger than the first one. It's almost in the reverse. I actually call this a hellquake. I think when Jesus, we talked about last week where Jesus went, I believe when he was coming back up, listen to me, when he's coming back up, the earth shook when he came back up. This is the great earthquake. It's there for a reason why the bigger one is, the, is at his resurrection, not his crucifixion. It's not normal. This is God showing you something's going on here. Uh, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. I'm getting chills when I'm about to tell you. So basically, great, mega. So here's my second question. Why did these women who had just experienced two devastating earthquakes, get up early, travel out of the city gates, down the Kidron Valley. By the way, that valley is the lowest spot. It is a fault line that leads to the major fault line, directly over a major fault line to the garden tomb. Now remember, they are first century women. They believe earthquakes are the hand of God. They also would do what every first century woman does as soon as an earthquake hits the area. Archaeologists have told us, and they found remains of this, and they found, they found writings of this, ancient writing, that the people, once they find an earth, when the earthquake happens, they head for the hills. It makes sense. Earthquakes are in, the, are in the valleys, they're in the rifts. They head for the mountaintops. They abandon their homes until they know it's a, they're able to come back. We have no knowledge of what happened in Jerusalem on these two earthquakes, but let me tell you something. I promise you, it was, it was sparsely populated after this, these two earthquakes. I promise you that people were fleeing to the hills. What would you do if two earthquakes, if one, great, one earthquake happened in Birmingham and then right by your house and then another one happened? Would you stay there? Would you venture out to anoint a body? Of course you wouldn't. Listen, would you venture out walking down the actual fault line, the active fault line, after two large quakes? I don't think so. So what does it show us? What does it teach us? Should they have not have been hunkered down, seeking some type of shelter, or at least running to the mountaintops? Believe it or not, these ladies, I believe, are the epitome of what it means to have faith. And they actually prove a Bible verse that we all know. They love Jesus, so much so that they were willing to overcome their fear and imminent danger and journey to that tomb against their logic during a time of massive seismic activity at Ground Zero where they lived in Jerusalem. You know, it's really interesting to me. I did this study, uh, I guess I studied for Monday because we didn't have a Wednesday. I studied for Monday as soon as I came home from the plane. Sunday, I studied all day Sunday. I studied for Monday. I, I, teached, I taught on Monday. I studied on Tuesday a little bit and then I studied on Wednesday for tonight. And last night, after I studied, last night, I got up and God gave me a quote. I don't know what happens to you, but I get these quotes. You've heard me see some of them. And when he gave me the quote, I didn't know what it meant. He gave me the quote, I wrote it down. I thought, well, maybe some future message, I'll tell the quote. Then I read back over my notes, and I realized that the quote was for you today. Here it is. Faith and logic travel in opposite directions. To have one, you must abandon the other. Then repeat it. Faith and logic travel in opposite directions. To have one, you must abandon the other. Now, I'm not saying you don't have logic. You can have logic in lots of things. But basically, if you want to use your faith, faith has nothing to do with logic. How many, somebody say amen. Matter of fact, some people try to have their Christianity and logic at the same time. It's impossible. Faith reaches out where logic fails. How many are with me tonight? I like that quote. So here's the verses that they prove. Watch this verse. They have no fear. They love Jesus. They have no fear. You know the verse. John 4, 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out all fear. Now, they're human beings. They know that their life's going to be in danger. They know they're walking on an active fault line that just had two major quakes. The last one, bigger than the first one, which is totally unbelievable. And they, st they venture out. How many are with me tonight? How many are seeing this tonight? It's brand new. Listen to it. So, our world... I know, according to Scripture, we'll see more literal earthquakes in the future. There are some big ones coming, according to Scripture. I told you I was going to give you some other ones, but before I do, let me show you this. A couple more quotes. Faith ends where worry begins. Worry ends where faith begins. And I like this one. God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. And these are not just verses, these are truths. And then guess who else has another quote here? <laughs> go figure. Here you go. Real faith is evident when you recognize that you are acting fearlessly. 
All the while knowing you should be afraid of things, but doing them anyway. Let it sink in a little bit. Real faith is evident when you recognize that you're acting fearlessly. All the while knowing you should be afraid of things, but you do them anyway. So, we know that our world's going to have more earthquakes. Number 13, Gog's future earthquake in Israel. We know that the nations of Gog and, Ma and Magog is actually a ruler, but Magog and Gog, Russia, is going to come down in Ezekiel chapter 30, 39, according to the last day's prophecies, and they're going to attack Israel. But did you know that God's going to swallow them up? He's going to destroy them with an earthquake? That's what the Bible says in, Ex in, in Ezekiel chapter 38, verse 18 to 23. The super colossal earthquake, by the way, will destroy the invading armies. Number 14, Messiah's future earthquake in Zechariah. Zechariah 14, 4. This, look at that earthquake fault line. Look at the temple. Remember I told you where the temple was when Jesus is right near that fault line? Well, the Mount of Olives is right there in the red. And basically, that Mount of Olives earth fault line is going to go right there and it's going to quake. The Bible says that the mountain, um, that Mount Moriah is going to shift. It's going to go from the north to the, up to the north, from the east to the north. And Christ is going to come back and ride on a white horse onto that elevated plain. That's a, that is an earthquake that is coming in the future after Armageddon. After Armageddon. So, how many are still with me tonight? Through the Word, we can see that God has His hand in earthquakes many, many times. But we need not to forget number 15. Let's go back a little bit. He sent one at the uh, a Jerusalem prayer meeting in the summer of, tw of AD 29. When Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit fell, the place, it says the place was shaken. Uh, so, basically, we see the same, the same seismic activity happening and the Holy Ghost set down. So uh, that's Acts chapter 2. And then you know the one about the Philippian jail. Paul and Silas, Acts chapter 16. Matter of fact, this is the actual jail cell that Paul was in. I visited it not too long ago, several years ago. And it's still being shored up by what the earthquake did. So lastly, the 17th earthquake, Jesus said this about today's, about the day you're living in. He said, that there will be signs of his second coming. There will be earthquakes in diverse places. Look at that map. That's last week's earthquakes. Every single one of those red lines is a minor one. The green one is the next step up. And the dark green are real big ones. That's last week. Earthquakes are extremely increasing. So we're living on the last days. So these are for this past week. But you don't have to be caught in a physical earthquake to feel fear. You would, your world may be shaking all around you right now. Matter of fact, I looked at this and I felt, God, you know, where's the application here? And he showed me. He says, there's lots of people who fear a lot of things. Some of you have your earth-shaking moments. Some of you have things happening in your life that's absolutely shaking you to the core. We were in, Ven we were in Venice. We were preaching. I was preaching on a beautiful plateau that was a, a little terrace that was overlooking the Grand Canal. I was actually doing a wedding. And there's a photographer there. there everybody's Catholic in, in Italy. There's a photographer there. And his name was Gabrielli. He was a young man. He was a photographer for Vanity Fair. It was a top-notch wedding. And I started to do my service. And I did the wedding. And of course, I, did, I taught during the wedding. He was all ears. He came to me asking me all kinds of questions. And I could see his heart was reaching out for the gospel. And I don't know if his life is shaking, but I sensed something. I sensed him looking for something. Let me tell you something. Some people will only find God when their world shakes. And some people, even when their world shakes, need to cling to God more. He's our refuge and our help in times of trouble. How many are with me tonight? So, your world may be shaking all around you tonight. And you, like Paul and Silas, need help. And you need help quick. And let me tell you one last Mark Carell, Mark Carell quote. We're hitting up on Mark Carell today. You can either let your circumstances shake you, or you can let God shake your circumstances. My um, nephew's with us tonight, Stanley. And Stanley is, uh, where is Stanley? Stanley, stand up, Stanley. Stanley has cerebral palsy. And you may not know the... the um, Stanley didn't know I was going to do this tonight. I didn't know I was going to do this tonight, but I got to do it. You may not know the circumstances to Stanley's life, but Stanley... My sister was extremely close to me. Matter of fact, I took, I took, uh, I took her two kids to, to church. Uh, and you could, uh, every Sunday, Cheryl and I did when they were young. Uh, Stanley came a little bit later and uh, a couple years ago my sister got stage 4 cancer and died within what two months Cheryl? Four months. Stanley was uh, in his house and by the way he was house, house and he didn't walk he crawled 
My sister doted over him and he crawled down the steps. Stanley, I hope this isn't embarrassing you tonight. And his world was shaken and, and Cheryl and I were just devastated. His dad did not want him. Told, told me, put me up on the, against the wall, tried to anyway, and I wouldn't let him, and said, you need to take him. Well, how many of you know I didn't have Stanley? How many know that? I did not birth Stanley. How many of you know that? How many know that Cheryl didn't birth Stanley? So it was his responsibility not to mention the fact that he had a large trust fund for Stanley that he wasn't giving any money out of. So Cheryl and I took him down with us because I had led Stanley to the Lord about three weeks before his mother died at a service. I also led his mother to the Lord about three weeks before she died. And so Stanley comes down and uh, basically Stanley didn't know how to walk. And uh, when he, before he came down, he started walking. We got him down here and Stanley has been growing like a weed. <laughs> Last Sunday he got the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I don't even know if Stanley knew what it was. But let me tell you this. You want to talk about someone's world who's been crushed? It's been Stanley. And we were driving over here today and he says, you know what, Father, then you and, and Sister Cheryl, I don't have any family. I said, Stanley, you have God. He says, yeah, I know that. But let me tell you one thing I know about Stanley. And again, I don't want to embarrass him. I'm sure I have already. I've never heard him complain about a single thing in his life. If I don't call him and I'm away from here for two weeks and I call him up and say, hey, Uncle Mark, how you doing? It's not, where'd you, where have you been? Don't you know I'm down here? Doesn't anybody care about me? I have never, ever seen that. Stanley's studying to go into the ministry. He's taking his third class to go into the ministry. What I really think about Stanley is I think that he's an inspiration to all of us. He's an inspiration. But you know what? Sometimes we get so focused on our own little world, don't we? What we have going wrong with us. We need to understand that these ladies had pushed everything they had to the side and their great love for God made them reach out and go in a very, very tough area so that they can find God. Tonight, I want to pray for you, but I want to tell you something. There's a great shaking going on in our world. You're not seeing it yet. You're not seeing it hit America's shores, and I'm not trying to scare anyone, but listen, there is a great shaking going on. Something's about to happen, and it's going to happen big. Will God protect you? I think that he might just take you out of here before it happens. But basically, you need to know that your world doesn't have to be shaken for us to trust God every day. Thank God you're here. You are the, you're the choir that I'm preaching to. But listen, frequently remind yourself that God is with you, that he will never fail you, that you can count on him. And say these words with me. God is with me, helping me. Say it one more time. God is with me, helping me. I counsel people all the time. They all come with their life-shattering problems, and it is for them. And I listened to them, and Stanley said something to me today that just rocked my world. I was walking out, he said, take you home tonight. Sometimes he can't come because I can't take him back to where he lives. So Stanley said, to, I said, Stanley, you can come tonight, Cheryl said it to him. So he came, I said, I don't have anybody to counsel tonight. And he said this, and this is not against anybody that's coming for counseling, just listen. <laughs> I don't believe I'm saying this. He said, Uncle Mark, why do people have to be counseled? I said, what are you talking about? He says, can't they just read their word? I want to put that up on a quote. We have to understand the word of God is there to sustain us. Somebody say amen. Next week, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to pray for you in a moment, but next week I'm going to tell you why Jesus folded his napkin from his face and laid it aside. It'll absolutely blow you away. Most people don't understand why he did that. We're going to talk about the resurrection for the next couple weeks, Lord willing. And let me tell you something. I believe that you and I need to get in a resurrection position to rise above our world. Would you just bow your heads with me tonight? Oh, it's so great to be home. One reason is because I don't have to go on that eight-hour flight again. The next one is just to see you and your hearts. I know your world. I know there's things you're dealing with with your family. I know there's things you're dealing with with your jobs. I know there's things you're dealing with with your health. The enemy loves to shake up our world and put fault lines all around us. But listen, when your world shakes, that's when you need to seek out God the most. When your world is falling apart, the whole, whole problem with people is they get so self-sufficient sometimes, their world, nothing's happening, and then when something happens, they don't know where to turn. We're turning to him right now. So tonight, would you stand with me for a moment? Frequently remind yourself that God is with you, that he will never fail you, that you can count upon him. 
Say it with me. God is with me, helping me. Because I like my quotes, not myself, let me read you these. You can either let your circumstances shake you, or you can let God shake your circumstances. Real faith is evident when you recognize that you're acting fearlessly. All the while knowing you should be afraid of things, but doing them anyway. Listen, when I went through chemo, and they kept sticking me with everything they possibly could in the hospital, I knew I should be afraid, but I wasn't. You know why? Because God's faith was given to me. Listen. Faith and logic travel in opposite directions. To have one, you must abandon the other. Would you bow your heads with me for a moment? I don't know who it is tonight, but so this message has somebody's name on it. I know it does. So if it's you tonight, I'm going to ask you just to raise your hand. All our heads are bowed. Just raise your hand. Say, man, this speaks directly at me tonight. I need to exercise my faith, the hand there. I need to trust God more. Another hand, another hand, another one, another one, another one, another one. All over this building. Let's pray. Father, I thank you tonight. I thank you, Lord God, for your people of faith, Lord God. Faith, the evidence of things not seen. I'm thankful tonight, Lord God, that no matter what happens in our world, 10,000 can fall by our side, but you will be there with us, Lord God. Your strength with that will uphold us. Lord, help us to listen to those women and when they, when they're in their hearts, Lord, as, they, as they, their perfect love cast out all the fear. Your perfect love for them cast out all fear. I'm thankful tonight, Lord God, that you love us with a love that is greater than anyone we can experience on this planet. And that, Lord, with that love, all of our fear can be gone. I praise you tonight, Lord God, and I thank you for those who have come. For everyone that has raised their hand, Lord, you know their, their in-between needs, Lord. You know their secret needs, Lord God. You know the needs they've never even expressed. Lord, and I pray tonight, I, er I, I earnestly pray tonight, Lord God, that they would take faith and conquer their world, Lord. Bless us now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand tonight. Amen. I will see some of you Sunday.